The leaders of our country are clear that individual civil rights are not the exclusive concern. It is clearly stated in the 10th Constitution, quote, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. There are certain rights reserved to the people with which the government, and especially the federal government, cannot interfere. And this is clearly defined in the Tenth Amendment. Now, we have all this discussion about the Fourteenth Amendment, but some of our politicians forget there is also a balancing of the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. For instance, the civil right of public education is by the Tenth Amendment a proper function of the states and local governing bodies. It was never intended. The leaders of our country clear that individual civil rights are not the exclusive concern. It is clearly stated in the Tenth Amendment, quote, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. There are certain rights reserved to the people with which the government, and especially the federal government, cannot interfere. And this is clearly defined in the Tenth Amendment. Now, we have all this discussion about the Fourteenth Amendment, but some of our politicians forget there is also a balancing of the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. For instance, the civil right of public education is by the Tenth Amendment a proper function of the states and local governing bodies. It was never intended that the federal government become involved in the performance of this function. Thus, from the beginning of our country, it was not intended that the federal government have exclusive rights in the field of civil rights, nor that it be the only party responsible for the protection of civil rights. Civil rights usually relate to individual rights, not group dynamics. It is for this reason that many of us are very gravely concerned that the Communist Party of the United States and other left-leaning groups have been actively trying to redefine what by law and tradition have been our American concept of civil rights and who shall enforce or protect those rights. Unfortunately, civil rights is thrown out all the time at us in the press. And yet you go down the streets, you can't find 10 people who will agree exactly what civil rights mean, except they will lead you to believe that there are thousands of people in this country who don't have any civil rights. That is false. And we ought to begin to show that to some of the members of our press. Now, the Communist Party of the United States has never been known to take a pulse reading or a poll to see if any given group institution or movement is agreeable to being taken over. They just get the job done and do it very efficiently and positively. They don't come around and, and, and say, well, everybody here that would like to be controlled by the Communist Party, how many are in favor? They wouldn't dare. They just achieve this by sheer cunning, long-range planning, patient manipulation, and more important, a coordinated strategy of infiltration these are the communist ingredients for group control. Now, the much publicized civil rights movement has been a main and highly successful target of communist control and infiltration since the 1920s, and the record will show it. Just plain everyday grassroots reading of various civil rights publications, or on the other hand, communist publications or organs, and a common sense evaluation of these publications, I believe, produce the following facts. One, the fomentation of conflict between the races in America has been a key program of the Communist Party of the United States for many years, and it is today its major domestic program penetration and control of the civil rights program. Two, the Communist Party of the United States, through its members and its various sympathizers and activists and front groups, has had heavy influence 
and exerted decisive leadership in the conduct of the so-called civil rights movement. And it continues to provide that decisive leadership right at this moment. Three, the United States is to establish and distrust between conflict and more important, outright civil disobedience. Adam Clayton Powell is quoted that it is a divine right of people who are working in the civil rights movement to break the law if they think it's right to break the law. Four, the Communist Party of the United States is utilizing this climate of terror to attain federal intervention by force and compulsion into state and local affairs and to achieve passage of legislation fraudulently miscalled civil rights bill for the ostensible purpose of helping the Negroes, but for the real purpose of concentrating fantastic and unbelievable powers over individuals, organizations, and local governments, and to concentrate this power in the executive branch of the federal government. Five, the concentration of such power in the federal government makes that government much more susceptible to achievement of the ultimate objective of the Communist Party of the United States, and that is internal seizure of the United States. Six, the realistic and legitimate objectives of the Negroes and other minority groups can and must be achieved by means other than those given to us by the Communist Party. Well, these are startling conclusions. People say, well, can you prove it? How have you arrived at these conclusions? I can't believe those things are true. Let me try. The communist emphasis on race agitation in America is not new. As the result of a raid on the Communist Party convention at Bridgman, Michigan, and clear back in 1922, Americans were made aware of a secret Moscow directive signed by the Executive Committee of the Communist International. It was entitled, Concerning the Next Tasks of the Communist Party in America. The directive was carefully marked, not for publication, and was given to the top-level communists in the country at this time. They were instructed to utilize, and let me quote from this report, utilize the Negro mass movement for racial disturbance and create an auxiliary force for class warfare to aid the Communist Party. Now that's a direct quote. In October of 1925, the Communist Party organized the National Negro Labor Congress in an effort to obtain Negro recruits for the Communist Party. Six years later, a report of the House of Representatives, the Special Committee to Investigate Communist Activities, is entitled, Investigation of Communist Propaganda. It described this communist campaign to enlist the support of the Negro in these words, quote, the task of the communists among the Negro workers is to bring about a class consciousness and to crystallize this in an independent class political action against capitalism, to make every possible issues which will tend to develop race feelings with the view of utilizing racial antagonism. At every opportunity, the attempt is made to stir up trouble between the white and Negro races. In fact, said the report, there can be no doubt that the aim of the communist is to create a powerful proletarian movement which will fight and lead the struggle of the Negro race against capitalism, and thereby further the cause of the world revolutionary movement and a dictatorship of the proletariat. So they didn't really care about the Negro from the beginning. They've made it clear. They only want to use him as they've used any other group in any other country for their advantage. The Communist International in 1930, he said the Communist Party of the United States has always acted openly and energetically against Negro discrimination, that sounds fine, and thereby one increasing sympathy among the Negro population for the aid and support of the Communist Party. 
That's what they're really interested in. Another quote from the Communist International of 1930. Even if the situation does not warrant the raising of the question of uprising, one should not limit oneself at present to the propaganda for the demand, but should organize, now remember, this is instruction to communists. The communists should organize mass actions such as demonstration strikes and boycotts on behalf of the Negro. In 1932, William Z. Foster, who was then chairman of the Communist Party in the United States, published a book toward a Soviet America. This is the blueprint by the communists for the control of this country. People say, oh, well, goodness, this doesn't have much. Hey, if you'll read this book, you'll find that Mr. Foster recommended for the national legislature a legislative program that he said would greatly advance the Communist Party in this country. If you will read his book, you will find that 70% of the legislation recommended by William Z. Foster in 1932 are National Congress. Now, Mr. Foster, in his book, Toward a Soviet America, set forth the blueprint for communist infiltration, influence, and leadership of the so-called civil rights movement. Let me quote, the Communist Party, said Mr. Foster, actively promotes organizations to work for Negro freedom. Where no mass organizations exist in these fields, the Communist Party takes the initiative in forming them. Where such are already in existence and are headed by conservative officials, and of course the Communists call anybody who opposes them a conservative, the party follows the policy of building an opposition within them and fighting for the revolutionary program and leadership of the Communist Party. This is the so-called boring from within policy, said William Z. Foster. End of quote. Now, more recently, the Communist Party of the USA, at its 1959 convention, passed the following resolution, quote, A central task of the progressive forces within the Negro people movement is to aid in the promotion of a recognition of the inseparability of the struggle for world peace and of course, world peace to the communists is when complete international communism is established everywhere. This struggle for world peace is inseparable from the Negro movement, they say. The foes of world peace and the oppressors of the Negro people have a common class root, the destruction of capitalism. A common bond of interest links the fighters for peace and the fighters for the Negro people in the United States, end of quote. Hyman Loomer, who's editor of Political Affairs, which is called the theoretical organ of the Communist Party of the USA and has been identified by J. Edgar Hoover, in an article called Peace and Civil Rights, he made the following statement, quote, the key to the future in fighting both for peace and civil rights clearly lies in the strengthening and the advancement of the mass movements and struggles in the Negro field. The possibility and the need of setting masses in motion now exists as never before. In this connection, the fight for the Negro has become the focal point, which at this juncture holds the key to all other struggles, including the fight for peace. What is demanded, therefore, said Mr. Loomer, is that all progressive and left forces, and especially all communists, throw themselves fully into the battles which lie ahead on this front. Now remember this is July 1963 that these orders were given to the communists and they know as communists that they must as a discipline follow this and they were told this is the key movement which holds the key to the future for peace and peace to them of course is world communism. So one only need to transpose the word peace into international communism to gauge the tremendous importance which the communists themselves have assigned its movement. In the August 1963 edition of Political Affairs, there was another article by Benjamin J. Davis, the well-known Negro communist. He's chairman of the Communist Party in New York. In this article, he said, quote, the communists hold that the race crisis is the central domestic issue before this country. The Communist Party greets with boundless joy the present revolutionary movement of the Negro people 
and will spare no sacrifice to help bring about its total victory now. They aren't interested in the Negro. They just want to cause internal conflict, race hate. That's what they're trying to promote because then they feel they can control the forces that will be the ones to come in and force this rebellion to be put down. Now the importance of the racial strife to the communist and their intentions vis-a-vis -vis the civil rights crisis are manifest. But proof of communist intentions does not constitute ipso facto proof of their control or leadership in this conflict. In criminal law, it is necessary that there be a joinder of an act with the intent in order for a crime to be proved. Similarly, it is not enough for us to show that the communists have stood by on the sidelines, spewing forth their venom in this whole subject of civil rights. It is incumbent upon us to provide sufficient evidence for reasonable men to conclude that the Communist Party, through its agents, various front groups, and sympathizers, has sufficiently saturated the civil rights movement to be able to exert decisive leadership in that movement, to be able to completely call the shots. Just as the district attorney cannot always hope to be so fortunate to have a defendant confess his crime, so here we must rely on obvious evidence, rational judgment, and common sense. We cannot always hope for absolute proof, that is the confession, of a given man, oh yes, I'm a communist and I've always been a communist all my life and I'm leading this particular phase of the civil rights movement. They just usually don't do that. You remember Castro denied that he was a communist in this country, but our State Department knew full well he was a communist because they had the reports in their file showing he was a communist. The point I'm making is the communists within a given movement do not come forward and volunteer that they're communists. We usually have to ferret out the information to show that there is reasonable evidence that they are, in fact, communist motivated. So let us begin with the most prominent organization in the civil rights movement, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The August 1963 issue of Intelligence Digest reports as follows, quote, as of February 1957, the directors of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People has been subjected to strong communist influence and has had the following number of identifiable communist front associations. We all know that an identifiable communist front is one identified by the Attorney General's list as to be known to be controlled by communists and I think there's some 267 now listed as communist fronts. So this is where this information was obtained. Channing H. Tobias, chairman of the board, 44 identifiable communist front associations. William Lloyd Immis, vice president, NAACP, 31 identifiable communist fronts. Oscar Heimerstein, second, DP, 25 identifiable communist fronts. Algernon D. Black, Board of Directors, NAACP, 61 identifiable communist fronts. Hubert T. Delaney, Board of Directors, NAACP, 18 identifiable communist fronts. A. Ralph Harlow, Board of Directors, NAACP, 23 identifiable communist front organizations. Benjamin E. Mays, Board of Directors, NAACP, 32 identifiable communist fronts. Eleanor Roosevelt, Board of Directors, NAACP, 82 communist front organization. Now you understand that was just bad judgment. <laughs> Earl B. Dickerson, Board of Directors, NAACP, 72 identifiable communist fronts. W.J. Walls, Vice President, NAACP, 38 identifiable communist fronts. Now on July 29th, 1963, Representative Gathings of Congress presented in the congressional record information from the files of the House relating to fifers, members of the board of directors, legal, health, and other committees of the NAACP, as well as to certain members of the organization's executive staff. These individuals 
have more than 450 identifiable communist front activities. Roy Wilkins, executive secretary, has seven known communist front affiliations. A. Philip Randolph, president of the AFL-CIO Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, chairman of the August and national vice president of the NAACP, has 20 identifiable communist front citations. John Hayes Holmes, national vice president of the NAACP from 1954 to 1961, had 30 identifiable communist front affiliations. A major founder and key leader of the NAACP for years, W.E.B. Du Bois, in his lifetime, clearly while he was on the board of directors and nobody ever really complained, he had 96 identifiable communist front activities. He received the Lenin Peace Prize in 1959, and he culminated his lifelong support of Marxism by publicly holding a press conference in 1961, and he said, I've really been a communist all of my life. I'm now making it official. He held a press conference. Then he promptly went over to Africa to help the Communist Party over there. Now, this gentleman, Mr. Du Bois, passed away the day before the March on Washington. And seven leaders of the Civil Rights Movement, the March on Washington on March 28th, stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and praised this man as the greatest leader of the Civil Rights Movement. Well, let's talk about the August 28th March on Washington. This was actually managed by the deputy director of the march, Bayard Rustin. Rustin was a member of the Young Communist League at the College of the City of New York in 1936. After he finished college, he became an active staff member of that organization. So it wasn't just young idealism, you understand. Then he was race relations director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, an identified communist front. He was a member of the American Forum for Socialist Education, a cited communist front. He was a member or worked closely with a sizable number of other sympathetic communist organizations and was a so-called impartial delegate to the Communist Party of the United States 16th Annual Convention in 1957. He also served as the Congress on Racial Equality field secretary for many years and from 1955 to 1960 was Martin Luther King's secretary in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which organization I'll cover a little later on. Rustin was convicted of sex perversion in Pasadena, California in 1953. All of this wonderful background didn't seem to be any apparent concern to A. Philip Randolph, who was called the March Director. Mr. Randolph was questioned by the press, why have you got this man as your Deputy Director? And Mr. Randolph raised, uh, lowered his voice and said to the press very proudly, he said, why, he's Mr. March himself. We couldn't do without him. His outstanding ability and talent and background make him invaluable. End of quote, Mr. Randolph. Now, he can't be quite that naive, do you think? 